All right, my name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at the Nicholson Library. It's June 5th, 2015, and we're talking to Jerry and Jackie Painter. And we always start these interviews out with a nice, easy question for you, and that question is, why Linfield? How did you end up associated with Linfield? Well, in my case, it's very simple. My mother had a younger sister, and the two families lived in the same community, Twin Falls, Idaho, South Central Idaho. They each had four children. Seven of those children came to Linfield. Six of us graduated from Linfield, and three of us met our spouses at Linfield. Uh, and so obviously it's been a family institution. The last I knew there were 25 alums related one that have attended Linfield. Not all of those 25 graduated. Our, uh, we had a daughter who was here just one year, but uh, it's, uh, uh, let's see, I lost my train of thought. That, <laughs> uh, anyway, I, I considered other schools, but basically Linfield. And of course, I had actually been on campus in 1940 and 41 when my uh, oldest sister and my one brother graduated respectively in 40 and 41. So uh, I had seen the campus and liked it and uh, it's a beautiful campus. Anyway, that's the reason I showed up. It was almost like you had, you, it was just a legacy to fulfill that. I, uh, in some respects, I really didn't have much of a choice, but in actual fact, the folks did not pressure me to come to Linfield. I uh, considered other schools, but uh, one of the reasons I selected Linfield among the other schools is that the tuition was considerably less. <laughs> you people won't believe this, but my the fall of my freshman year, 1946, the tuition for that semester was $75, which meant the faculty were being paid peanuts. I mean, you know, it's ridiculous when you think about it. The second semester, it was $150. And the reason was the GI Bill, and I will want to speak about that later. How about you, Jackie? How did you end up here? Uh, I was raised in the first in Yakima, and I attended the First Baptist Church. Uh, and uh, every year, uh, groups of Linfield students would come and uh, either perform plays, you know, religious type plays in church or they or the chorus would come. Uh, so I was aware of Linfield and uh, when um, they, that was before they really did much in the way of recruiting students. I don't think they even had an admissions department then. It was basically the faculty that would go out. But anyhow, um, they would have a weekend in uh, late, uh, it would be in the se uh, second semester in spring, called the Washington Cavalcade, and they'd encourage students, uh, prospective students, who went to the various churches to come and visit for the weekend. And I had a friend who was a year ahead of me, and she uh, was at Linfield, and uh, so she urged me to come, and I stayed in the room. I don't know how, they. there were two people to a room and maybe I was on the floor I don't <laughs> I don't remember but anyhow I thought it was wonderful and uh, um, I uh, so after I saw Linfield you know I my 
I was the first one in my family to go to college. And uh, so I didn't get it. I, my family weren't discouraging, but they didn't know anything about it. And, you know, as far as going out and visiting different colleges like our kids did, didn't do it. I came. I liked it. And so I showed up the following fall. And uh, I think you ought to add who the friend was. Yeah, I was going to, and then I went by it, didn't I? Okay. The friend was Jean Michael. Uh, uh, her her husband, Tom, Tom and Jean, are uh, both alums. Uh, Tom graduated, Jean didn't, and didn't. And uh, anyhow, uh, they became our closest friends. It still are. We're inter we're interviewing Tom next month. We're yeah. really excited about that. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So it was Jane, uh, and uh, and then when I came back, uh, we would double date. And anyhow, we have an ongoing relationship. He went to seminary in Berkeley. We were living in Berkeley, and. Uh, Jerry had a, had a job with a large national CPA firm, and uh, so we'd go out with him. We had no money, but we went to movies, rode the bus. <laughs> so then how did you two meet? Uh, well, it's a fairly long story. Let me tell it. Okay. <laughs> uh, homecoming that fall. Uh, Gerald's four years older than I am. Uh, he graduated in 1950, and I came in the fall of 1950. So he wasn't here, um, but he was uh, in graduate school at the University of Oregon, and and uh, he was uh, taking accounting because there wasn't an, he hadn't had enough count, accounting here to. Uh, passed the CPA exam, so he needed more. So he was there, and he had a friend who had, uh, who had graduated and was teaching in Amity, who was going with a woman in <laughs> <laughs> Gloria. So he said, uh, and, and Gerald wanted to come back uh, and for homecoming. And uh, so uh, Frank, his friend, asked Gloria to find him a date. So we met on a blind date. I say Gloria did a pretty good job. Uh, the week before, a couple weeks before or something, I had a blind. I was on a blind date. It wasn't. I. It wasn't awful, but it wasn't. It didn't click. <laughs> we put it that way. <laughs> and uh, you ought to mention who the date was. No, I won't mention who the date was. I don't want that. No, 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 no. It was somebody. You might recognize his name, but he's he's dead anyhow. But uh, uh, so uh, Jerry came, and we had uh, I, it was it was great. And uh, he went back to Oregon, and he sent me a thank you note. You ever got a thank you note for a date? Nobody had. <laughs> Everybody in the dorm read it. Believe me. <laughs> it was great. It was great. Yeah. So anyhow, I. I did not, I finished the year, and I got very good grades, but, you know, my mind was on other things, and I was totally infected by all the veterans coming back that were married and everything. And so, uh, we were married the following summer, but I did go back to college later, about the time my kids were going to college. I went to college. I would like to add that. She, after I sent that note, she invited me to attend the Sadie Hawkins Day dance. Interesting. So nice. I did, and she kept it, and, and still has it, the calendar for that year. And she would mark on the calendar the weekends that I showed up 19 times. <laughs> and it was all Hitchhiking. Hitchhiking. In those days, um, I would encourage anybody to hitchhike now, but in those days, there were still a lot of traveling salesmen on the road. And uh, 
I don't think I ever waited more than 10 or 15 minutes for a ride. It was relatively easy. And I would stay with this friend in teaching anatomy. Uh, his name was Frank Starkey, by the way, and he graduated in 1949, uh, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Became an attorney, and he's unfortunately, gone he's gone, as is his wife, who was in we're, the home. We're telling the whole story of our lives. This is perfect. This is, this, that's, that's the whole point here. Oh, okay. well, you asked me why I went to Linfield. <laughs> I, I can I, tell you the distance between the Oregon campus and the Linfield campus. It's 93 miles, 263 yards, <laughs> two feet, three and a half inches. <laughs> I wanted to say something about the faculty because you said, why did we come to Linfield? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I didn't know anything about the faculty when I came, but I, I was a good student. I got a scholarship and, and because of, of the fact that I'd gotten A's in English in high school, I didn't have to take the first semester of English. I went, they, it, was the, it was required, probably still is, two, two semesters of freshman English. And so I went into the second semester. Well, later it caught up with me. <laughs> when I went back to college, I was missing a unit there. So I took a Shakespeare class. But I had wonderful, wonderful experience. I had a, a, French, a French professor who was, that was just great. I, I was a music major. Uh, Amy Lee was, the, was my teacher. Uh, I loved her. Uh, Milo Wold probably was the professor that meant a lot of the most to me. Now I didn't, because I was a freshman, I didn't, you know, just the one year, I didn't take a whole lot of classes, but he taught a course called Music and Art in the Western World. And it was so oh, it was it was my first real introduction to that whole subject. And we had to do a paper on it. I had it was it was just great. I I used to have that paper around. <laughs> Anyhow, that was that was uh, I so I was kind of sad too to leave Linfield, you know, but he won. <laughs> he didn't try to take me away, but uh, I, uh, it just, the way it worked out. Well, we were referred to talk to you by Debbie Harmon Ferry over, the Director of Alumni mm -hmm. Relations, and she told us to ask you, as long as we're talking about burgeoning relationships, she told us to ask you about um, your sister Sally meeting her husband Harry here at Linfield. Yes, yes. And we discovered that they um, left a scholarship fund here at Linfield also, which we think That's is right. Amazing. But we were, we were told to ask the story about how Harry met Sally here at Linfield. Okay. As I noted, uh, well, I didn't know. Sally was my oldest sister. She's 10 and a half years older than I was. I'm the baby of the family. And unfortunately, I'm the only one left of the four of us. Uh, she worked for a year. She graduated from high school in 35, but she worked for a year. So she didn't enter Linfield until the fall of what, 36. 36. Yeah. That's why she graduated in 40. Well, Harry Pryor lived in Boise. Uh, his family, he was an only child, uh, were active members of the Baptist Church in Boise. And uh, he got to know the Gibsons. And the Gibsons are this family I, that my mom's younger sister was Florence Gibson. She and uh, uh, the Gibsons, as I indicated, all came, all four of them, the Linfield alums. Anyway, uh, because Tracy, Tracy started immediately out of high school. He would. He, was the he and and my sister were born in the same year in 1917, 
and but he was a year ahead because he did not work for a year as my sister did Sally and uh, of course Tracy knew Harry Pryor very well through youth activities in the church and so on and uh, so Sally went to Boise so that uh, and how she got to Boise I suppose on the bus I don't think the folks drove her but I'm not certain of that I don't remember <laughs> I, I was only uh, at the time eight years old so anyway she gets to uh, Boise and you would have to have known my sister to realize uh, the kind of person she was wonderful wonderful person but she always had a lot of gear with her whatever <laughs> and uh, she was lugging a typewriter <laughs> that she was taking to Linfield. And it wasn't a portable. And, right, it was not <laughs> a portable. And uh, the reason was that my dad insisted that she learn uh, not only to type, but also to take dictation. So where she worked was for dad as his secretary. Uh, Dad was a country banker, and I emphasize country. There's a world of difference between a banker in a small rural community versus the bankers in that megalopolis <laughs> east of here. Anyway, uh, uh, here she is. She gets off the the bus, and I guess she had they had to transfer and it was a fair distance so it must be that they took the train because they had to get from the bus station in Boise to the train depot and, and the train depot then was on the outskirts of Boise it's now there's a lot of Boise beyond the, the what was then the edge of Boise Anyway, here she is, I'm sure, with a bag and lugging this typewriter. And Harry Pryor offers to carry the typewriter. And one could say that was the beginning. They certainly got to know each other. But actually, they dated other people. They did not start dating immediately. I don't think it was until the sophomore year that they began to date, but by the time they were juniors, they were officially, uh, God, what's the term? Pin. Well, yeah, he pinned, <laughs> pinned her, but uh, you know, it's engaged. Sure pin. They were formally engaged. Let me let me let me put a footnote here. Okay. Uh, when Sally and Harry celebrated their fiftieth wedding anniversary, it was a big deal. They had a nice dinner and all, and a and a big program. It was in a hotel in Bellevue, Washington. And uh, anyhow, uh, their kids did a skit about how they met. That film called "When Harry Met Sally." had come out and so they did they they acted out the business with the typewriter and everything it was really cute <laughs> and and Harry always said he didn't realize how heavy it was and <laughs> so he already offered right yeah but he offered <laughs> it was not a portable yeah. so how in the heck I guess dad I had rigged up a ropes around the thing so you could know. carry it. I can't imagine. Those things were cast <laughs> iron. <sighs> so you mentioned this a little bit earlier when you were talking about the faculty here, but we're kind of curious what your impressions of Linfield were when you were here in the late 40s, early 50s, what okay. campus yeah. was like. I was a business major and there was one business prof who also taught economics 
President Dillon had been the econ teacher and the school didn't have enough money to replace his position. So Harold Elkington, one of the dorms, is named after Elkington, and I was uh, honored and privileged to speak for the alums at the dedication of, uh, of Elkington Hall. But nobody called him Elkington. He was Elky, what? never to his name, to his face, <laughs> never. <laughs> or actually we addressed him most times simply as prof. Because then, in the, and I believe it's today, uh, business is one of the larger majors. And uh, uh, at the time, I did not think he only had a master's degree. And I figured, well, and he began teaching immediately, so he had had no real on hands-on business, uh, active working in the business world. I was hired by this when I finished a year at uh, University of Oregon, and by the way, I was able to pass CPA exam. And Elkington is the one that got me a graduate fellowship. Uh, Anyway, I'm hired by the CPA firm in San Francisco. That, and there were nine of us hired that summer in that office. That office all over the United States, but in the San Francisco office that summer of 1951, they hired nine people. Um, I think, I'm not certain of this, but I think I was the only one that had not graduated from the University of California at Berkeley or Stanford. And I was very apprehensive. I said, my God, I'm going to have to compete with these guys from these two very well-known schools that had big business departments and et cetera, et cetera. Well, of the nine people, three years after we were hired, there were only three of us left. And I've often realized and, and said to myself, Painter, you're lucky because Elkington made us do a lot of writing. Whereas at UC, particularly UC Berkeley, those guys that be graduating are almost illiterate. <laughs> and I was an auditor, and one of the things you had to do as an auditor was write a memo describing what you did and the steps you took to audit a particular item in the client's financial statements. And thanks to Elkington, I was one of the few people that could write a coherent sentence and a decent paragraph. And, and uh, so well after I graduated, I began to realize that Elkington was a great professor. The other reason he was a professor was that while he lectured, he also would raise and ask a lot of questions. It got a dialogue going, which wasn't the standard way of, of teaching in those days. And he would ask the most ridiculous questions and yours truly would get his backside up and respond very vigorously. And years later, I realized that guy did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> to, to get a dialogue going, you know. Anyway, 
So Elkington was my number one uh, professor. Jackie mentioned Milo Wold. I was drug kicking and and uh, screaming to his class on art, music and art, and music the and art, particularly in art. I learned some new words that growing up in South Idaho, I don't think I'd ever heard, <laughs> like Rococo. <laughs> Professor, and he also taught in a lot of dialogue form. He, and he, was, he did something. You didn't say who he was. Oh, he was a he professor did. of English. I, yeah, I, of course. Yeah. He and uh, the only C I got at Linfield was in his class of American literature. And I've often blamed the fact, and it really, I shouldn't do that, but I blame the fact that for three weeks that fall that I was taking the course, I was gone on forensic trips. I was uh, under Mahaffey, I was uh, one of the, my, and my sophomore year, I was the manager, student manager of the forensic team. Anyway, uh, the only reason I uh, was able to pass American Lit, and I got a C, the only C I got at Linfield, was Moby Dick. That rescued me. <laughs> because he did not, Terrell did not give written exams. They were all oral, and he would ask various members of the class uh, questions. And, that, and even the final was not written. And I really think that that probably was wrong, because he couldn't possibly uh, have gone through you know, ask a question to every student in the class, American Lit, there were probably 30 kids in the class. Anyway, those, uh, particularly Elkington and Terrell, are the two professors I remember the best. I took, uh, I won't go into the detail, but I wasn't, I had left Linfield uh, at the end of my sophomore year thinking I wasn't getting enough business courses. Went back to uh, uh, Northwestern in Illinois and being taught by grad students. And because I was a transfer, I had to take a lot of uh, undergrad, uh, under, Lower what do you division. call it? Uh, lower, divi low, lower. lower division yeah, courses. Yeah, required. And I, then I developed a stomach ulcer and I had to drop out. And uh, Elkington, I, I decided by the, by the following summer, I was able to start in again, going back to school in Elkington. Uh, arranged with a local woman to give me my dinner because I had, had to have, in those days, long for Zantac, you had <laughs> to have special food, which the diet today is ridiculous. But anyway, she was able to, to uh, give me the food I needed. So I went, I took a double load, double course in summer school that summer and therefore was able to graduate with the class I'd started. And one of the courses was from Terrell on the tragedies of Shakespeare. There were four of us in the class and I think probably it was the best course I had 
this class I had at Winfield because there his system of asking questions and not having written exams worked very, very well. And I remember that uh, that summer, uh, Henry V, starring uh, Lawrence, Olivier. Lawrence Olivier, came out. And I was able to see that. And I was the only one in the class that had seen it and was able to re Terrell asked me specifically to talk about it. Anyway, that was a, a great class. Okay, your turn. Uh, I, I just wanted to make some remarks about Lynn. You were talking about Linfield's quality of education. Mm -hmm. Just anything about Linfield. Um, well, uh, because of what I did later, after I did graduate, I became a librarian and worked at a college in New England where we both, Jerry was working too. And uh, so I worked with students myself and with faculty. And uh, of course, I experienced education as an adult, which is very different. But anyhow, you're so highly motivated. It makes a big difference. Anyhow, uh, I, I think it's really important to know why you go to college. And that is not to it's great to learn things, of course. It's wonderful and it's lots of fun, but it's to get into that habit of learning and inquiring because that's just the beginning of your education, not the end of it. And that's one of my standard lectures to students. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'd wor I had work-study students working with me and everything, but I think it, it certainly was true at Linfield, regardless of the fact that most of the faculty in those days were not PhDs. Most of them just had masters. But that was true of a lot of other colleges, too. A it, PhD it, does not guarantee a good teacher. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think anybody that's gone to college knows that. And uh, another thing is an adult student, you uh, have a, a broader viewpoint and you can evaluate faculty uh, in a way that you don't as a youngster you know and and uh, so I advocated if you have a chance to but don't don't quit going to school just because you graduate <laughs> it's fun to go back and, and audit and, and and study and all my life I've had various kinds of projects and so has he we always have something going a good way to stay sharp and keep, keep, keep on top of things. Well, I, it isn't something I do deliberately. It's just kind of one thing we, I, we both read. In fact, that was one of the reasons we got together in the first place. Uh, I had read this murder mystery, and uh, uh, he had read it too. I think he was the first guy I ever met that read books. Now, that sounds awful, but actually, I, all you girls are smiling. <laughs> and I remember when I was in, in college that uh, there's a lot of fellas that don't really start reading until they're in high school and, you know, until later. And uh, when I was a children's librarian, I, uh, or I got kids going on that. But, uh, yeah, I, that really brought us together. And we're still both reading. <laughs> uh, you mentioned uh, President Dillon. We're curious if you have any specific memories of, of him during his time here, during your time. Oh, many. <laughs> um, one of the first things I'd say is that the spring of 1946, the year I started at Linfield that fall, but in the spring semester, there was less than 400 students at Linfield. In the fall, the enrollment had doubled to just under 800, and it was due to the veterans returning from World War II and the GI Bill. Jackie and I, uh, together turned out the 50th 
our 50th reunion in the class of 50, a book that's about that thick. And in it, I wrote an essay on the GI Bill and the importance of it, significance of it to higher education. The bill had been proposed by uh, the American Legion. Actually, the American Legion wrote the bill. Two college presidents were quoted as saying they were both very concerned about what would happen to the quality of education because now the hoi polloi are going to be going to school, no longer rich men's sons. And those two presidents were the president of Harvard, the president of the University of Chicago. To illustrate how wrong they were, my class was 44% of the class were World War II veterans. When we graduated four years later, 60% of the graduates were World War II veterans. So it was just absolutely the opposite. And mainly because these guys that had uh, uh, years taken uh, off their lives, uh, and uh, many of them married, so they were a heck of a lot more serious about going to college than 18-year-olds like me who were here to have a good time. Oh, we were going to learn something, but the main reason you went to college was to have a good time. And, uh, uh, what about Dylan? And I've often thought, thank you, and I've often thought, how did Dylan do it? I mean, to have the enrollment double between the spring and the fall, he didn't have either the, the time or the money to hire more faculty. People like Elkington, they were, Elkington that fall taught six courses. The faculty today would go out on strike if they were asked to teach six courses. <laughs> And they were all different. It wasn't having three court, three classes of the same subject. They were all, you know, he was trying to cover the waterfront. So number one, how Dylan pulled that off, I just. Oh, the buildings. And then he began building. And the main way they built there in the 40s Remember, the school's endowment, I think, was 500 or 600,000. It was very low. The U.S. government made the buildings on the military bases built during World War II available to higher education institutions for nothing. All they had to do was pay to have the building transferred to the campus. So Dylan took advantage of this because there was a, a base at Camp Adair between here and Corvallis. This is a swamp, by the way. And uh, uh, the, the, what was for many years the chemistry building? Uh, God, that terrible. I took chemistry and took it from the professor who retired at the end of my senior year. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was his name? Uh, anyway, the building was named after him. That was a barracks at Camp Adair, converted to a chemistry building. 
the uh, original, uh, I shouldn't say original, on the corner where the science building is now, two barracks were in a kind of a Y like this, and the, the stem of the Y was a theater from Camp Adair. So you had the theater, and in one of the barracks was the speech department, and the other uh, speech and drama, and the other was um, music. Music. That those buildings burned, I think, sometime in the sixties or seventies, caught fire. Mahaffey lost all of his stuff that he had accumulated over the years as a forensic professor. Anyway, uh, that was two of the buildings. The building that uh, for years was the building and grounds before Keck campus, uh, it's over near the old heating plant. That was named after the building superintendent whose wife was in charge of those of us who worked, it wasn't called work study, but it really was, uh, did the cleaning in the dorms. Uh, and she had the, the linen and it would be handed out once a week, uh, et cetera. Anyway, that, that building had been a barracks at Camp Adair. But probably the most interesting thing that Dillon did, as I said, the GI Bills, the GIs dominated the campus. And many of them were married. Well, this is a relative, then the population of Lynn of McPinville was maybe five or six thousand and uh, housing was a real problem for a couple. From the military base in Vancouver around what had been a fort during the, oh gosh, the 1800s, uh, they had on that base four apartment buildings, and there were four apartments in each building, two above, two below, and the two opposing apartments shared a bathroom. <laughs> Can you imagine? There's that, and, and these people, uh, none of them had children, there, so they were just the husband and wife. But here they were sharing the facilities with another. But that yeah. is much different than the dorms, I guess. <laughs> well, anyway, so in, in each one of these buildings, there were then four apartments. And they were where the athletic uh, building is now, the gymnasium, etc., on that corner. It, and uh, the baseball field was just in back of the apartments. One cute story that I learned when we at, uh, we were getting histories from the class of 50 and our 50th anniversary. Reunion. 50th reunion yeah. book. This wife of one of the, I think her husband had died by then, but she sent in a memoir for the book. And she said that in 1949, when there was an earthquake, that was very similar to the earthquake that happened oh, four or five years ago. The center was up in southern Puget Sound, uh, and essentially the same fall slipped. And anyway, she wrote that 
they had an upstairs apartment and she swears the only reason the building didn't collapse was the wallpaper. <laughs> anyway, that was, I would say, Dylan's major uh, benefit to uh, Linfield. And actually, they, uh, during his tenure, I think three of the uh, dorms were built. And, uh, well, the low cost government loans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Two percent, one and three quarter percent. And Dylan was one of the first in line. My sophomore year, Memorial Hall, which is the stadium, was built. And that was built with bonds, these low cost bonds specifically for higher education. But they, you could not use those bonds to build an administration building. They were strictly for student housing and faculty offices. And I often wondered, didn't any of the bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. question a dormitory in which one wall of the dorm is at an angle? I mean, surely somebody would have thought, now wait a minute. They didn't, they didn't come and look at it. <laughs> Anyhow. Anyway, uh, Dylan obviously was a, a president that held the school together uh, despite the surge of students. Uh, so he certainly is one of the more important presidents that Linfield has had. Uh, you mentioned uh, sometime that you were talking about uh, how you were planning on going to college to have fun. I'm curious uh, how you had fun while you were here. What was uh, what did you do outside of class? Well. Um, you mean the work I did no, on no, campus? No, 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 no. Fun. How'd you have fun? Oh, fun. Oh. <laughs> I would say most memorable for me, I was a uh, Ta Delta Sigma fraternity. No longer exists. It went national my senior year. And I told the, the group, the younger guys wanted to join the national and I said you're going to be out of business in five years if you join the national because the um, fee to join the fraternity would have been was forty dollars well forty dollars at that time was a lot of money and I said you're gonna have a hard time recruiting people well I was dead wrong fraternity failed in three years <laughs> rather than five. Anyway, the first time I ever got drunk was at a fraternity <laughs> You <function>. asked for it. <laughs> and I didn't drink at all, and I particularly did not like beer, and that's what they were serving. So I chugged the luggage as quick as I could because I didn't like the stuff. Oh my God, sick. I can still remember how sick I was. It was awful. Well, how about things like dances and uh, so uh, how, about, how about sports? Football my games and... my uh, class was the first one to talk the administration, Dylan, into allowing on-campus dancing. That's right. You know, remember this School was started by very conservative Baptists and no drinking. The other thing that would, they bent the rules, you could have alcohol in your room, dorm room, but you were not allowed on campus. You, uh, 
Boy, I don't remember that. <laughs> yeah. Well, the guys do. Yeah. <laughs> no girls ever even I can, such a I thing. I can see in the girls' dorm it wouldn't have been a They issue, can smoke. With the... In their room. And they could smoke in the room, but not on campus. Mm -hmm. And remember, during World War II, the cigarette companies who were smart guys, oh, yeah. they knew that it was addictive, and therefore we introduced smoking to everybody. They added to the K rations for soldiers free cigarettes. So almost every veteran smoked. They weren't allowed to smoke on campus, but they could step off campus. So where they would congregate between classes and have a quick smoke was, um, I can never remember the name of the short street that starts with a B that is just west of the old library now, T. Is that Blaine? Blaine, yeah. And there were homes, by the way, all along there, mostly owned and occupied you know by where faculty. Where the parking lot is now. Where the parking lot yeah. is now, where uh, two or a couple of homes owned by faculty. Anyway, they'd get out in the street, because that was, quote, off campus. And that street was just littered with cigarette butts. <laughs> it was amazing. Uh, so we had dancing on campus. How did you convince President Dillon to let you dance? I don't know. I wasn't responsible, so I don't know what the argument was. But I, again, I think the GIs were older. Tell about the football game with Willamette. <laughs> <laughs> Willamette, the last time Linfield had beat Linfield when I started as a freshman, Linfield had not been victorious over Willamette since 19... I believe is 26 or 27. They didn't play each other every year in those days, but almost every year. Anyway, it was, good to him, it was uh, 18 or 19 games that Willamette had won in a row. Well, uh, this is my senior year, so it was the fall of 1949. By then, Durham had arrived and was the football coach. And his second year, he came the fall of 1958. And uh, Dylan and he had a, a good team that year, although it was a losing season, but it was a good team for Linfield. Dylan said to the team, if you beat Willamette, I will stand on my head at midfield. <laughs> they did. They won 20 to 7. Dylan stood on his head. I was there and I didn't see it. <laughs> but, and it was in the mud. He had to, I mean, <laughs> you can't imagine what a football field looked like here mm -hmm. in Oregon. Oh, yeah, before there was... Uh, by the uh, end of the game, there's a well-known picture, which, by the way, we, I put, had put on the back cover of our 50th reunion booklet, of the team coming off the field. They're carrying Durham. You cannot read the numbers on the uniforms. By the time the game was over, you couldn't even tell who was on which team. They were and all brown. How in the heck the <laughs> officials knew where to place the ball? 
What a mess. The markers were all gone. I guess they'd look at the side of the field and say, well, okay, boom, That's down in the mud. Someone took a picture of that historic event. Of the By the way, everybody called him Prexy. I'm sure not to his face, but they called him Prexy. Anyhow, he stood on his head. Someone took a picture. I think it was in the newspapers. I, do, I don't know. I That picture has disappeared. and. No, no one knows. I know I worked with the archives, my, the photo archives, and it's too bad because that certainly was a historic <laughs> occasion. <laughs> but yeah. he, was, he was really beloved by the students. Uh, and and he, he did uh, talk to them and relate to them. You know, he, wasn't, he was very much around. Yeah. Everybody knew who he was. And the college was so small, half what it is now. And uh, as I said, it seemed like there was something building every year that I was here. Yeah. Uh, and that was the response of more students. There had to be more classroom space. So how, how have you seen your, how has your relationship with Linfield evolved over the years and how have you stayed connected to the school even though you haven't always lived right next door? We haven't most of our life. Right. So how have you stayed connected? I forget why, but we have made a contribution to Linfield every year since I graduated or since we were married, I should say. Not, now that first year in 51 when we were married, it was only $5. Yeah. And for many years it was about that fiber. It wasn't very much. So, and I suppose because of my career, I became a CFO, Chief Financial Officer of two different higher education institutions and therefore am well aware of the fact that tuition does not pay the cost of the education. Uh, it simply does not and so uh, any institution is very dependent upon mostly alumni but also friends of the school uh, to share some of their resources with the school. It's extremely important. And I guess I felt that from the get-go. And why somebody must have said something, I don't remember being urged particularly, but uh, we, from the time we moved to Ber Berkeley, the summer of 51, uh, were uh, active in alumni activities. There usually was at least one uh, gathering of, Lin of Linfield alums in the Bay Area. And in fact, one of those, I was the person that organized it and got it going. Uh, we we lived we've lived three different places since we were married. We lived in the Bay Area about twenty years, uh, and then we moved to Vermont and worked at the college there. And we were there for twenty years, and then we retired here, and we've been here for twenty years. <laughs> and uh, while we lived in Vermont, of course, we were working at college, and we were a lot awfully far away. We didn't come to. Uh, homecoming, but we we visited the campus several times, and we visited Tom and Jean Michael, and of course, uh, Tom was uh, an absolutely outstanding uh, uh, person on the staff, and he loved Linfield dearly, and all he had wanted to promote it, obviously, to and uh, 
hit students, and uh, so he took us on tours. And so we were aware of what was going on, and we were in touch with them all along. Um, but uh, I don't think we ever, in those days, there weren't any Linfield events going on on the East Coast. I think maybe now there there would be, but uh, we certainly were very much aware of it. I consider that I was privileged to serve in higher education. Uh, from a personal finance standpoint, I'd have been a lot better off to have stayed as an active CPA because in colleges there's no bonuses, no stock options. But the quality of life we had particularly in Vermont, with her working in the library, we often walked, we only lived two, three blocks off campus. We'd walk to work together, walk home together. We even skied to work <laughs> at times. A few um, times. So mm -hmm. it, the quality of life, there was a lot of activity going on for faculty and staff. And, we always participated, but I look back and I owe it all to Linfield. Now, obviously, I, I'm sure Willamette graduates would say the same thing, but the I am a strong proponent. If you can, go to a small liberal arts college. The interaction you'll get is much better than in the big campuses of the major universities. Now, they, their quality of education they maintain is better, and it may be. They certainly have with more well-known faculty and so on. But so much of the learning process the interaction between the students and the faculty and faculty interaction uh, and I just think you get that a lot better at the small private liberal arts schools. Where, where do you see Linfield going in the future? Where would you like to see it go? How would you like to see it change? I personally uh, uh, hope that it won't change much. Mm -hmm. Now the problem in higher education, I'm sure you're all aware of this, is that a lot of learning is now taking place on the internet. And the typical classroom, uh, almost one-on-one -on -one relationship is maybe obsolete down the tube, I don't know, but the uh, because it's relatively expensive. I, I, think, I think that Linfield, uh, the best thing they can do to prepare for the future is to hire people that are highly qualified to teach, to continue to encourage good students students that are interested in learning and they're the ones that are going to figure out how to meet the challenges you know we've been out of the loop for years and years and uh, constantly amazed at all the innovations and and sure all there are lots of challenges for the online learning but it also uh, enables people to, to do things they couldn't do before and uh, so I, I sort of hope people uh, still have books, real <laughs> books. <laughs> but uh, you know, most a lot of people would look at what we're looking at here and say that's obsolete. It's all on your online. iPad. Yeah. What do you need this stuff for? Yeah. You can't you can't flip back and forth. But in you know iPad. the same 
attitude, I guess, toward change. Uh, the first institution I became involved with was the Theological Seminary in Berkeley. And one of the trustees made the comment, what do you need books for, new books? You have a library, hasn't everything been written <laughs> that oh. needs to be written or no. has been written? What do you find, what are you spending money on new books for? Well, in some respects, uh, people would say, well, I'm gonna look, get my education online. My reaction is they have very little in interaction between the faculty, between them and the faculty, and no interaction with other students. Yeah. And I just consider that extremely important. It's a part of the overall learning process. I well, don't you have collaborative uh, where you get together in small groups? And Yeah, I know, that's one of the, that's a great way. And people did that informally years ago, but now it's a more formal. And I know uh, the college where I worked now has done a lot of remodeling of their library to provide spaces to do that. And that's, that's one of the, there's all these neat things that these young people and young faculty can figure out to do. Yeah. To, but I don't think anything, I, I, I think that chance to get to know the faculty is something that's unique in a small college. Uh, even if they're not the, the most famous ones in the field still, if they're enthusiastic about teaching and about their subject, well that's, that makes it fun and it leads you on. It's much more inspiring. So I certainly encourage the small college. Obviously, we're hoping that Linfield will, is not a dinosaur. No, I don't think so. Uh, and finally, it's beginning to get a respectable endowment. It still is considerably less than it should be, but uh, and, and I'm biased of what I'm going to say. The sports at a small college, I think, play a much bigger role than at the big university. University of Oregon cannot put in their stadium all the students. That's perfectly obvious. Why? Because they need the money from adults to come watch the games. I mean, for the, to support now, the sports in, program. In a sense, mm -hmm. that's happened at Linfield. The covered stadium, one whole section for years was students. Now, students are relegated to, to the end zone, and I think that's too bad. Uh, but that isn't what you were going to say about sports. I think sports is extremely important uh, because the, any school has an opportunity to uh, reach people that are not necessarily alumni to support the school. So I think it's a great PR. But what about the educational uh, process? But here at the small school, particularly Division Three, and this is why I'm such a strong supporter of Division Three sports, no athletic scholarships. An athlete receives financial aid the same as any other student, and that's normally need-based and the need is developed by independent organizations. I think that's extremely important. 
because that means the, the young people we see on the playing field or on the court are doing that because they want to. They like it. They're not going to become pros. A Scott Brocious is an anomaly. <laughs> And he, he would be the first to agree that, you know, his career was very unusual for a Division three uh, person. But it just is so much fun. I, I was a sometime athlete in high school. At six foot two, I was the tallest kid in school. So I was the center on the basketball team. Could I play the game? No. I didn't know how to dribble. I passed reasonably well and had a decent shot. But I couldn't handle the ball. Anyway, as a result, I didn't play sports here at uh, Linfield. And I got such a kick out of watching these young people do things that I could not do. Besides, I love to scream at the umpire anyway. <laughs> but, but I think it's, it's so many more people can take part when, you're, when you don't have these, when so much money isn't involved yeah. like it is at the big colleges. The, the big universities, it's a major business part of the school, and uh, uh, they're, they're essentially minor leagues for the pros. Yeah. Whereas here, the emphasis on student athlete, not an athlete who happens to be a sometime student. <laughs> uh, at the school we were at in Vermont, and I'll bet this is true of Linfield, the athletes have a higher graduation rate than the student body as a whole. And that's because the coaches ride herd on them. The coach says, I'm not going to spend my time coaching you if you don't go to class and study. If you flunk out of here, what good does that do me? And uh, I, I think that's reflected in the fact that, the, that, in general, they have a higher graduation rate. Anyway, I just think sports is an extremely active part. And, and I'm the first to admit that it's expensive. Football is very expensive. You have a lot more people as a result. Or you have a, a lot more equipment that has to be purchased. You have more coaches and the maintenance of the playing field and, you know, the whole nine yards is uh, just makes it uh, very expensive. Uh, How are we doing with the questions? We're great. I have one, left, one question left for you, and that is, is there anything I've forgotten to ask <laughs> that you need to tell me? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Oh, I, I think I ought to say one thing about the reunions. Mm -hmm. We've sort of become the re. In fact, we should get paid. Uh, we've uh, been in charge since, since your, well, when we first came, you were in charge of a reunion. Of the first. I think fraternity of, that no longer exists. Yeah, and oh yes, yes, I did think of that, and that is a that is kind of a good story. The Tau Delta Sigma, which no longer exists, but when we started going together, uh, he let me wear my wear his fraternity pin. They called it pinning. Anyhow, that was a big deal, and that was a historic pin though because it belonged to Harry Pryor. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I guess he loaned it to you, or you loaned it to me, or something. I, I gave it to me, but anyhow, and then later gave it back. Of course, I got a diamond ring, so I, okay. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, we uh, 
Jerry got the idea of having a reunion of the Tau Delta Sigma because uh, there were these guys had formed a, a several of them be, had formed close friendships and uh, were living in the area and uh, so uh, he organized this mm -hmm. uh, along with Tom Foster who was also in his class and they uh, contacted everybody that could but there was a very famous person that was a member of that class and that was Joe Medicine Crow and he uh, got the Presidential uh, Medal of Freedom I think that's what it's mm -hmm. called and was on the cover of the Linfield Review um, what is that the alumni magazine mm -hmm. yeah and uh, anyhow uh, Joe uh, was and still is living on the Crow Reservation in Montana and uh, he, did, he didn't have very much money. He did not have enough money to come to this reunion. He was a Taw Delt. And so several of the brothers uh, gave some contributed money to pay for Joe to fly. And so Joe flew out, attended this reunion. And uh, on Sunday, he spoke in the First Baptist Church I don't quite know how that came about, but anyhow, <laughs> that, w that was very special. He was in our home, and we got to meet this fascinating man. Uh, and so that was the first reunion, and then he organized. Everybody is always delighted when somebody else takes charge of a reunion. And it normally is done by people who are living in the community. It's a lot easier. You really can't be in charge of it if you're living far away. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Jerry was in charge of the <clears throat> 50th. And, uh, and then my class of 54, and I had still remained friends with a lot of the class, even though I had, didn't live here. Uh, and uh, didn't continue and so I was in charge of my class she did all the paperwork <laughs> yeah <laughs> not entirely and anyhow we're quite a team and uh, there was a 60th reunion in uh, 2010 mm -hmm. that we have I don't know whether there'll be another one or not well, I won't. Uh, I won't elaborate. But we also do high school reunions too. <laughs> <laughs> Just like eating another project. Right? As at a distance, and that is it. It's harder, but yeah, possible. Anyhow, that's the. It, if, it's just really fun to to find people, to search out people, and talk to these people, and and amazing how much you can remember, how it kind of comes back to you when you talk to people that you haven't had anything to do with in years. We, um, when we were thinking of retirement many years ago, uh, Tom Michael was on the East Coast at some seminar that he was attending and spent a, a night with us. Oh. And, uh, we got to talking about where we'd live in retirement. And we said, since we both were raised in small, smaller rural communities, we'd rather stay in a small town rather than the big city. I'd had it to up here with the Bay Area the 20 years we were there. And, uh, but, thanks to her, were very much involved in fine and performing arts. So he said, we'd like to be next to it, near a city, so we can take advantage of the fine and performing arts, but we don't have to live in this city. And the last thing, if possible, we'd like to be in a community that has a college, because we've been involved in higher education for, uh, Oh gosh, over 30 years. And Tom Michael looked at me and said, You idiot, you just described McMinnville. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, it 
crazy when you think about it. I, I, we just never thought of retiring here, but it, but we're certainly glad we did. The future of Linfield, who knows? Boy, I hope it has a good future. Well, it certainly is doing very well right now. So I right don't know now, why it sure doesn't have any signs of coming to an end. No, I would say just the opposite. So we're very proud of Linfield, actually, and uh, I think a lot of the things that are going on are really exciting. Good, we think so too. For example, the um, the symposium on Lincoln mm -hmm. that was here in the library. Oh, what was that? Last year, year before? No, it was last spring. Yeah, the one each of the last two springs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that was. Great. Anyway, we found it very enjoyable. The only problem was it wasn't properly advertised. Advertised in the and. So there were relatively few local people. We certainly enjoyed it, though. It was very inspiring, and it was really fun. Yeah. We've we've had, uh, you know, we could talk for hours about all the different things we've done. He was in you. What what were you doing? You were in plays. <laughs> yeah, two different I, plays. I was in two different plays. The first play was <laughs> my freshman year. Barrett's of Wimpole Street. It's about. And I was one of the brothers. This is Elizabeth the, Barrett. Oh. Barrett Browning. Okay. No, the Browning. Mm -hmm. Barrett, Elizabeth uh, Barrett, and, and Robert. She Brown. had five or six brothers. And I look back on it now and realize very appropriately I was the deaf guy. <laughs> well, I'm deaf without my hearing aids. Yeah, but you weren't deaf then. <laughs> anyway, uh, I, to learn my part was very easy because the only thing I said was, huh? <laughs> huh? That was his career, but he, he went on to bigger and better things. <laughs> <laughs> then as a um, sophomore, or was it my senior year? I think my senior year. Uh, the uh, play... Um, Oh gosh, the Marx Brothers made a movie of the play. Oh, uh, it's about the a. Uh, is that the ship? No, it it has to do with it's something like the producers. Anyhow, it was a comedy. The, the a, of course, Marx Brothers, it, it would be a comedy. <laughs> Room service. Room service. He, uh, Room service. Anyway, I had the role of the harassed uh, hotel manager. <laughs> yeah, and he, he, he was in several, a uh, couple plays at Gallery uh, and uh, major roles. And, uh, and I... I've, in the meantime, I've been doing music all my life. I was a chorister from the time I, before I went to Linfield when I was in high school. And I've sung in choruses all my life, all when I was in Vermont. And I did a little theater too, but not, well, a little bit of gallery, but mostly uh, in Vermont. Yeah. I, did, I did musical uh, operetta type stuff. And uh, anyhow, we always kept busy. <laughs> I have a feeling that the small school also promotes more community act, uh, particularly on the part of the students doing things for as volunteers for the community. Certainly, that's right. That's right. Is, oh, yeah. Right. Has been doing that for many, many years. You know, there, Linfield does is, is involved. That's one. That me, our our video people have left, but uh, I think uh, the 
college that we worked for in Vermont did not have this wonderful town gown relationship that McMinnville has with Linfield. Really is supportive. Uh, and Linfield very much involved in community things. And that's, that's very special. And I understand it is a problem in other places, not just where we lived in Vermont. Because the college where we were was in a blue collar, basically a blue collar town. So they really thought of the college as an elitist place. It really wasn't, but there was a big gulf between. That isn't true here. That's right. And one of the reasons we love living here is that that kind of an atmosphere, supportive and, of the and college. And maybe, I really don't know this, but I suspect that those of us who went to college, particularly the small college, and did community service are more inclined to share what resources we can with the community. Uh, I think we've talked long. Aren't you? You're pretty well done, honey. They're just listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're getting bored. Oh, we could be here all day. But I know, but <laughs> I, you're going to get bored talking about it. this. Is like when we were being interviewed by the newspaper. Well, in that case, thank you very much for your time. Oh, we'll I'm delighted. Recording.